Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 62. <laughs> About two years ago, the Lord used this psalm to absolutely change my life. I will never, ever, ever be the same. And so tonight, I decided we're just going to look at it. We've been covering several psalms at a time, but um, we're just going to take our time tonight on this verse. Next Wednesday night, we will not have service. Yeah, boo. <laughs> Because Pastor John and myself are going to get on our motorcycles and we're going to ride up to the mountains for a week and make our way back for Sunday. But the other day I went out into the woods and recorded a devotion. So we'll have it uploaded to uh, the YouTube channel for next Wednesday at 630. So wherever you're at, you can pull it up and you still will be fed even though your pastor's a bum and took off work. Just kidding. Psalm 62. This is the only psalm in the Bible. I got your attention with that one, right? No, I know there's 149 more. But it's the only psalm in the Bible. The only psalm. What I mean by that is... In this psalm, the psalmist over and over and over again says, God is only. He is only. Now, in the English, we don't really see that that much. But in the Hebrew, if you look at this psalm in the Hebrew, every line declares that idea. God alone is my this and that and the other. God alone, God alone, God alone, God alone. And so that's the title of our study tonight, God alone. That's why we call it the only psalm in the Bible. In this psalm, we're going to see that God alone is our salvation. God alone should be our expectation. And God alone should be our realization, our salvation, our expectation, and our realization. If we will learn the truths of this psalm, and I'm learning myself, it will completely change our lives. Absolutely guaranteed change our lives. Now, what's interesting, in this psalm, the psalmist is under a time of deep stress, in a trial, a struggle, a trouble, if you will. But what's interesting in this psalm is there's not one petition. Not a single request. Even though the psalmist is in this time of stress, this time of need, instead of asking something of the Lord, the psalmist just decides to declare who the Lord is and what the Lord is in his life. So let's just jump in, shall we? The first four verses is the first section, our salvation. You'll notice at the end of verse four, there's a selah. And then there's another selah at the end of verse eight. And so it naturally divides itself into three sections. And so David says, truly, my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. That word waiteth there means to be still. It means to be silent. It also means to be submissive. My soul, the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. David says, my soul is still. My soul is silent. 
my soul is submissive. And the reason my salvation comes from the Lord. During times of stress and trouble, there's a lot of chatter that takes place in the soul. Once again, the mind, the will, the emotions. There's chatter that takes place. And the decibel from that chatter causes discouragement, distress. It causes those things. And so the psalmist David is learning shh, to shush his soul. To shush the soul, to shut out the chatter, to learn to just wait on the Lord. I don't know about you, but when I'm in times of stress, I feel like I've got to do something. When I've got a problem or there's a need that presents itself, I feel like I need to do something. David says, no. I'm not going to take my mind and try to go to the drawing board and try to figure out how I'm going to solve this problem. He says, I'm not going to let my emotions run rampant and fear and, and stress and be anxious. No. Shh. He says, my soul waiteth upon the Lord. From him cometh my salvation. Here's an interesting note about that word salvation in the Hebrew. It is Yeshua. It is the Hebrew word for the name Jesus in the English. So he alone is my Yeshua. He is my salvation. Verse 2. He only is my rock. If you remember from our last study, the psalmist says, when my heart is overwhelmed, I will call on the Lord to lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The idea here of this rock is, is a tactical advantage. Being able to see, being able to be higher than the struggle, the trouble, the trial, the enemy the problem. He only is my rock and my salvation. He repeats this. He's my salvation. God alone is my salvation. David is saying something that may be a challenge for some of us. I am a recovering type A personality. Maybe you're the same. Type A people like to control things. And people, and time, circumstances, and finances, and they love to be in control. The desire to control is really, though, coming from a place of insecurity, a place of fear. And what's interesting is the only control the Lord says we have is self-control. So the more you try to control your friends, your spouse, your children, your situation, your job, your boss, your ministry, whatever it may be, the more you try to control those things, the more out of control you're going to become. And so the key to this need to control is self-control, which is a fruit of the Spirit, which means we, like David, need to go, shh, shh Gordon, shh, 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 quiet. God is my salvation. I will wait for him. He is my rock. Now, I may tremble on the rock, but the rock never trembles under me. I'm on a sure footing, a sure foundation. And I may be trembling, trembling, but shh, he's your salvation, Gordon. He's your savior. Have we forgotten who our savior is? How great he is. Wow, I think of Jesus in the Gospels. I, I make my way through the four Gospels every day as part of my quiet time. I go through the Psalms and the Proverbs, and, and then I bounce back and forth between Old Testament verse, I mean, check book, New Testament book, Old Testament book. That's kind of the way I make my way through the Scripture every year. Jesus is amazing. 
to me. The way he does things, the way he acts about things. I was reading this morning, he was healing a blind man. Some people brought a blind man to him and, and he took this blind man out of the city, out of town. And the scripture says, Mark tells us he spit in the man's eye. That's just really cool. I mean, I just can't see myself as a pastor spitting in somebody's eye, right? On a Sunday morning, they come up for prayer. You know, that would be it, right? That, they wouldn't be back. I'm, I'm out of here. This is, he spits in the guy's eyes. He touches his eyes. And he says, how do you see? And this guy says, I see men as trees walking. Now, I would have been done right there. Toast. Right? It would have, I would have just walked away and said, brother, I guess healing's not God's will for your life. I prayed, I, not Jesus. He touches him again and he makes him look up and he saw every man clearly. Jesus gets in a boat and in the middle of the storm, he's sound asleep. The disciples run around like a chicken with their head cut off. Lord, don't you care for us? And he sh shushes the storm. They make it to shore. They get out of the boat. And a naked man full of scars and cuts come running out of the tomb, screaming and hollering. I'm sure the disciples are like, take us back to the storm, right? We want to go back to the storm. The storm wasn't so bad. And Jesus is calm as a cucumber. Nothing moves him. Nothing rattles him. Nothing troubles him. He's my rock. He is my rock. What's interesting, 17 of the 22 chapters in the book of Revelation, about 45 times throughout that book, we see the Lord on the throne. He's on the throne. That's, cr that's crazy. 17 out of the 22 chapters, about 45 times we see him on the throne. He's not pacing up and down the halls of heaven. He's not stressed. He's not worried. He's not wondering what's going on. He's on the throne. He's in control. The Lord, my soul is going to wait because he is my salvation. He is my rock, David says. And notice he says, he's also my defense. He's my offense and my defense. He's my salvation. There's my offense. He's going to fight my battle. He's going to be my deliverer. He's my rock. He's my defense. The book of Proverbs tells us of some little things that are wise. The spider, the ant, the cooney. There's another one. The locust. But the coonies are these little bitty furry things. If you Google them in Israel, they're cute little things. But Solomon says they're a feeble folk. They're not strong. They don't have big fangs. Nobody's afraid of them. They're not going to attack you. They don't, they don't have any natural defense, but they make their home in the rocks. See, a type A person is probably going to raise their voice at you. They're going to puff up at you because they're trying to control you and everything around them because of their insecurities. And they're trying to make everybody around them think that they've got it all together. They're in control. They're large and in charge. But I don't have to be. See, when I understand that God alone is my salvation, I am not, as John the Baptist says, I am not the Christ. Well, who are you? I am not the Christ. Now, I know no one in this room Liter I hope, literally thinks they're the Christ. But there have been times in my life that one might think I thought that. Because if it is to be, it's up to me. If I'm going to change, I've got to change it. If, I'm gonna, if there's going to be a way, I've got to make the way. But I'm not the Christ. He is my salvation, David says. I shall not be greatly moved at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is talking about the resurrection. He says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for you know that your work is not in vain. Be steadfast, unmovable. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders, and he says that he knows everywhere he goes, the Spirit is saying he's going to make his way to Jerusalem, and there's troubles and trials and, the, and, and things that are awaiting him. But he says this, none of these things 
move me. None of these things move me. Now he's going to kind of give us a little bit of insight to maybe what was taking place to cause him this stress. He says, how long will you imagine mischief against a man? You shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall shall you be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. Which means to pause, to ponder, and then praise when you get it. So David is saying, I've got all of these people against me, these enemies. But he's not focusing on them. He's focusing on their behavior from a standpoint of concern. How long are you going to do this? But he's not asking the Lord to do anything because he recognizes God is my salvation. God is my salvation. The scripture says he's able to save to the uttermost. If the Lord saves you, can't nobody unsave you. Right? He is my salvation. And so, so David makes this abundantly clear. God alone. God alone. For David, and hopefully for us, there's no plan B. There's no plan B because we don't need a plan B. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're not careful to answer you, O king. Our God can. Deliver us. Our God will deliver us. But if he don't, we're not going to bow. Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job says, if God came down in front of me right now, took his sword and pierced it through my chest, I would trust him with every blow. Because he's my salvation. He's my salvation. The scripture tells us that after Jesus died and was buried, he rose on the third day. He presented himself alive to his disciples. He ascended up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Above all principalities and powers. He's been given a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow and confess he is Lord. And Paul says in Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ. And that's why he says we're more than conquerors. More than conquerors is, is being Adrian. You, you guys know who Adrian is, right? She's married to Rocky, right? Rocky fights the Russian. He fights Mr. T, fights all of these individuals. He, he goes into that ring and he's, he's there fighting. I forget the guy's name that trains him. Mick, I think it is. You know, the little bitty guy. And he's got a snarly little voice. And he says, get in there. You're nasty. You're, you know, whatever. He's in there. He's just fighting. He's fighting. He comes back to the corner and he's black and blue. I mean, he's getting beat to death. You know, it's kind of the idea. Hey, you know, he's not even hitting you. Get in there. He says, well, keep your eye on the referee, right? Because somebody is pulverizing me in there. At the end of the fight, though, here he is. He can't see out of his eyes. People are just going crazy in the stadium. And he's like, Adrian, Adrian, I love you, Adrian. She's more than a conqueror, right? They, they bring out that big check for the person who wins the fight. You know, they've got that big cardboard check with the money. And he hands it to Adrian. And that's what our groom did. He faced all of sin, everything Satan had, the entire world system, and he defeated it. And he hands to his bride the victory. We're more than conquerors. He always causes us to triumph. And we need to remember that. We need to understand God alone is my salvation. I can't lose with the God I choose. <laughs> right? I, I can't lose. There's no way for me to lose. We win. Amen? Well then, verse 5. This verse changed my life. Completely changed my life. As I said, I... I'm a recovering type A. 
person. You know, A stands for anger, attitude, anxiety, aggression. Had all of the above. Mad at the world and didn't even know why I was so mad. And God began to deal with my heart and heal me and deliver me from anger. But even though God had delivered me from anger, I was still just kind of, you know, just, just simmering under the surface. And it was, it was right up here, one Wednesday night during worship. I'm just seeking the Lord. I'm, I'm just praying. I'm like, Lord, I, I just thank you for what you've done in my life. My father was an angry man. I became the very thing that I didn't want to be, the very thing that I despised when I was little. I became that guy. And you've delivered me from that. But Lord, there's something still not right in me. Because even though I'm not, I'm not having spurts of anger, I, I'm just, I just stay a little agitated. And he brought me to this verse. Verse 5. My soul, he talks to himself again. Wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. I stayed disappointed, aggravated, agitated. Things didn't happen the way I wanted them to happen. Things weren't going the way I wanted them to go. I wasn't achieving the goals that I had set before me. All Just constantly agitated because... I was disappointed. They say the definition of disappointment is expectations unmet. Now, if we believe that to be true, and the scripture is more true than that, David says, for my expectation is from him. <laughs> my expectation is from him. Now, this word in the Hebrew carries two meanings. One is the predominant meaning, the one that we would naturally assume it to be, an expectation of something to come. But there's a thing called, scholars use, the power of first occurrence in the scripture. In other words, when you find a word or a concept or a truth for the first time in the scripture, a lot of times... There's great power in that, in understanding that concept, that truth, that word. I'll give you an example. Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 is where God says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to go up to the mountain that I'm going to show you, and I want you to offer your son there. The very first time the word love is mentioned in the Bible is Genesis 22. Take now thy son, Thine only son, whom you love, and offer him there. A picture, a foreshadowing of a father who has an only begotten offering that son. Here's another word that's found for the first time in that same chapter. Worship. Abraham says to his two servants... You guys stay here. I and the lad will go yonder to worship. Now there's you some homework, right? To, to think about this concept of love in the scripture that is, is seen with a father who loves his only son, but offering him and worship being revolving around the act of that giving, that sacrifice. Now, back to our study. The first time this word expectation is used in the scripture is in Joshua chapter 2. But it's not used in the way that we typically would think or the way that it's used most of the time in the scripture. It's used two times in that chapter and it's used for a cord or a rope. It's, it's the, the cord, that scarlet cord that Rahab put out her window and let the spies down to get away and escape. It's that same cord, by the way, that she was told when God delivers the city to his people, hang that cord out the window. 
So this word expectation carries two meanings. One is hope and one is rope. You say, well, okay, Gordon, big deal, right? What, what's the significance of that? The first occurrence is those spies hung their life on that rope. And Rahab and all that came into her house when the walls fell placed all of their hope on that rope, that cord, that scarlet thread. When you and I live by our expectations, we're attaching, we're tethering that cord to something or someone. If you look up the word expectation in the English dictionary, it carries about three meanings. One is you're, you're expecting something to happen in the future. You have an expectation. I'm going to get the job. I'm going to pass the exam, whatever. Also, it means that you believe someone is going to act a certain way or do a certain thing. And it also carries the idea of, of a prospect of something coming your way or an inheritance. You're going you're gonna to get something. So it's, it's, it's something that's going to happen. It's something you're going to have. Or it's how someone is going to act. Now, I know none of you have done this. Right? None of you have had expectations of what's going to happen. Like, I have never had an expectation that it was going to rain on vacation. I've never had the expectation when we took our son to law school that the transmission in the van was going to blow up on the side of 65. I never had that expectation. And so when that happened, we're driving down the road, I'm following my wife in the, in the van, and all of a sudden smoke comes boiling out of the van as she's pulling over, and I'm thinking, I'm about to lose them. They're going to go up in flames. I was disappointed. I was frustrated. I'm on the side of the road and cars <laughs> flying. What my grandfather taught me about driving when somebody is broke down on the side, nobody does that. Not even, not even big truckers, right? Truckers get on the side of the road and always get in the fast lane and go around them, right? They don't do that on 65 going through Evergreen, Alabama. I mean, so, I mean everything just, my expectations. I'm, I'm expecting the light to be green when I get there. I'm expecting the temperature to be just right. I'm expecting people to react, to respond the way that I want them to, to do what it is that I want them to do. I'm expecting to get something. I, I deserve that raise or I deserve that promotion or I wasn't picked for that ministry team or whatever it is. And so I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated, I'm let down. Because I've tied myself, I've tethered myself to something in my imagination. Because I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I have no control over what I'm going to get. Because sometimes even hard work doesn't always pay. At least financially. In all labor there is profit, the scripture says. But, but we don't always get what we expect to get from that labor. And most of the time, people never do what I want them to do. And so the Lord shared with me as I was standing right there during worship, Gordon, you have all of these expectations. You're living your whole life inside of your head. You're, you're trying to imagine, you're trying to create your destiny or, or your future by what you can imagine or think or dream up or desire. But you know, the scripture says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I don't know what's best for me. I don't. I think that sometimes, but I don't. When I look back over my life, I would have never chose the bad times. Never. I would have never chose the surgeries that I had, the sicknesses that I had, the times that I lost jobs, the time that people betrayed me, stabbed me in the back, let me down. I would have never chosen those things. But those are things that God ordained in my life to bring me to the place that I am right here, right now, to know what I know, to believe what I believe. Right? We want to we want to plan the mountaintops. But God brings you to the top of the mountain so he can take you through the next valley. 
He said, well, I don't want to go through a valley. But yea, though I walk through. Right? He brings me through those things. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, the God of all comfort, who comforts us so that we can comfort those in all the situations they find themselves in. So I can sit here today and say, I know my God will do this. Not just quoting a scripture or saying something that somebody told me, but I know that God heals because he's healed my body. I know God saves. I know God provides because he's done it in my life. And so he's saying, God is my expectation. So I don't wake up in the mornings anymore going, okay, today is going to be just like this. Now, I have a planner. I have a plan. I believe it's wise to, to do so. But things don't always go according to plan. And what I'm learning is I'm not freaking out when it doesn't. Because God is my expectation, right? We talked about this a little bit last week. This is what Paul was saying. I've learned in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. It's okay if it rains. It's okay if it's sunny. It's okay if it's cold. It's okay if it's warm. It doesn't matter. Because number one, he's my salvation. Number two, he's my expectation. The writer of Hebrews says that this hope we have in Christ is an anchor for the soul. It is sure and steadfast, and it entereth within the veil. I'm not anchored to something that's down. I'm anchored that's some, to something that's above. I'm tethered to Christ, who is behind the veil, in the Holy of Holies, at the right hand of the Father. And I'm learning if I will tether myself to him. Listen, he never disappoints. He never disappoints. He is my expectation. Now, before we move on, there's another verse in the, in the Bible that is real familiar to us, but it uses this word. It's Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith God, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I'm learning, church, slowly. <laughs> I'm learning that God's expectation for my today is so much better than mine. So much better than mine. And so I'm learning not to worry about how you respond to this message. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm learning to allow the Holy Spirit to develop in me self-control. So I'm going to spend time with the Lord. I'm going to spend time in his word. I'm going to receive what he has. And then I'm going to faithfully, with his help and grace, by his spirit, share that information with you. What you do with it is between you and him. I don't have a, oh, people are going to do this, or I'm going to get this many amens. or No expectation, right? You're my expectation. I just have to be faithful to you. This, listen, this will set you free. Husbands, this will set you free. I'll never forget when Jesus finally con convinced me that his commandment for me to love my wife has no strings attached to it. There's no if. Husbands, love your wives if she cooks good, if she cleans good, if she... No. Husbands, love your wives. Period. Well, what if she's not lovable? Don't matter. What if she doesn't deserve it? Does it did, I, did I say? I said, love her. He's my expectation. It will change your life. It will set you free. It'll give you the ability to love someone who is not loving you back. And, you, and it's not going to wreck your day or rock your world. You're going to keep loving them because God's your expectation. Because he got this. He's got it. Jesus said, you'll know the truth. The truth will make you free. This truth will make you free. Verse 6. We got to hurry up. He only, there it is again, he only is my rock and my salvation. This is the third time he's saying this. He's my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. Notice this, verse 6, I shall not be moved. In verse 2, he says, I won't be greatly moved. 
But the more he prays and the more he realizes who God is, he's saying, I'm not even going to be moved at all. Not even a little bit, right? At first it was, you know what? God's my salvation. I'm not going to be greatly moved. Now it's, I'm not going to be moved. It's amazing what's happened as he's moved from God is my salvation to God is my expectation. See, God's my salvation. I'm not going to be greatly moved, but I'm still being moved because, you know, the storm's coming and the arrows are flying and this is happening and I'm not even going to be moved. What would life be, dear saint, if the only thing that moved you was the Lord? I'm reminded again of Jesus in the boat. That's going to be in our, our study next Wednesday. Jesus is there in the boat. The wind is moving. The waves are moving. The boat is moving. The disciples are moving. Everything's moving. <sighs> He's at peace. Because see, Jesus says, I only say those things my father tells me to say. I only do those things my father tells me to do. The only thing that moved him was the father. And that's why he lived in the peace that he lived. That's, oh, hmm. Verse seven, in God is my salvation and my glory, my rock and my strength and my refuge is in God. Have you noticed this repeated word, my, 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 my? 16 times in this psalm, 16 times, David tethers himself to all that God is. He's my salvation. He's my expectation. He's my rock. He's my refuge. He's, and that's why in verse 8 he can say this, trust in him at all times. Trust in him at all times, ye people. And then he says something interesting. Pour out your heart before him. Do you know you can't fill a full vessel? You fill an empty vessel. David says, trust in him, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. Don't answer out loud. No facial expressions, right? Hide behind that poker face. When is the last time you poured out your heart to the Lord? Just poured it out. See, the beauty of learning how to pour your heart out is he feels it. That's why Paul says in Ephesians, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. That's a, a continual action. Continually be filled. Be filled again and again and again. And so as he pours into my life, I'm going to pour it out to him. And he's going to fill me again. I'm going to pour it out to him. And that's my life, just, just pouring my life out, spending and being spent for my sake, for my Lord. Because he's my salvation. He's my expectation. He's my realization. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Here's the realization. We're almost done. Verse 9. Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. They're a lie. It looks like they've got it all together. It looks like they've got it going on. But David said, it's just a lie. Because they're trusting in the uncertainty of riches. The scripture says, don't trust in riches. Because riches take wings and fly away. You know, everybody's working for that little piece of paper that says a lie. It says, in God we trust. But, but, but we don't. We trust in a little piece of paper. That's why we're freaking out because gas is so high and, and inflation is taking. We're, oh, what are we going to do? You're going to eat less. You're going to drive more. That's what you're going to do. 
You're going to budget what you have. That's what you're going to do. And God's going to make a way like he always does. I've been young and I've been old, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed begging bread. That's what you're going to do. You're going to be fine. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you've been through hard times in the past. God's going to bring you through this hard time. And then there's going to be times of plenty. That's what's going to happen. Because he's our salvation, he's our expectation, he's our realization. The realization is not what I see. We walk by faith and not by sight. It looks bad, Gordon. Aren't you worried? I might be trembling, but the rock that I'm standing on is not. He's my salvation. He's my exp- I know he's going to work it out. He's got an expected end for me. He's writing my story, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. It's not the end. Right? If, if it's bad, it's not the end because we know it's not going to be bad in the end. God's going to make it good in the end. So if it's bad right now, it's not the end. Hold on. Wait. Shh. So he says, don't worry about the measure of men. He says, to be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Multiple scriptures tell us. David says in the Psalms, I'm just smoke. Job says, I'm just a wind. James says, your life is but a vapor. It's here for a moment. It vanishes away. Trust not in oppression. Become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Don't trust in the measure of men. Don't trust in the method of men. Oppression, robbery, scratching and clawing, trying to get to the top, cutting people's throats. We don't have to do that. Aren't you glad we don't have to do that? Do you know the Bible says a man's gifts will make room for him? I've never had to worry about ministry because God's always going to have a place for me to minister. Sometimes it's been in my home. Sometimes it's been at a restaurant. Sometimes it's been in a movie theater that when you walk on the carpet, silver screen, You had to move, remove beer cans in the morning when we used to set up and it smelled like barf and, and buttered popcorn mixed together. Does it, but does it matter? Because where two or three are gathered together, he's right there in the midst. It's just as sweet there as it is anywhere else, right? I've learned how to abound and how to be abased, how to be hungry, how to be full. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's the realization I've got to learn, you've got to learn, we've got to learn as David is learning that Christ is my realization. It's not what my boss says, not what my doctor says, not what my family says, not what my enemy said, not what the media says. He's my realization. Look what he says, verse 11. We're wrapping this up. God hath spoken once. Twice have I heard this. I love that. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it. What does that even mean? David, are you kidding me, right? You've been challenging me, but God has spoken once, twice have I heard this. God has spoken once, and his word stands. But we need to hear it more than once. See, there's something about hearing with my ear and hearing with my heart. And that's what I hope is happening tonight. Jesus, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. God spoke once. He said it. It is settled, whether I believe it or not. You know, that bumper sticker, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. No. God said it. That settles it. Doesn't matter whether I believe it or not. God has spoken once. I've heard it twice. Twice have I heard this. Look what he says. Oh, I wish we had more time with this. Look what he says. That power belongeth unto God. Lord, help us to get this tonight. David is saying, let me paraphrase. God has the monopoly on power. You know what that means? Putin don't got no power. That means your president don't got no power. That means your boss don't got no power. That means your pastor don't got no power. 
That means your enemy. I know, I, I'll stop saying, because I know some of you, some of you grammar Nazis are going, mm, every time, don't got, no, yeah, I'll say. Doesn't have any power. You know, I, I could see it. Some of you are like, if he says that, well, I'm walking out of here. He has the monopoly on it. Matthew 28, Jesus says, all authority has been given unto me. All means all, and that's all all means. And so if he has all authority, that means you, I, we don't have any authority. Any authority that I may possess or operate in is on loan. God has established that king, that president, that congressman or woman. God has established those individuals and he will hold them accountable in how they use that given authority. God will hold parents, husbands. He's going to hold us accountable. On our own, we have no power. And David says, I finally heard this. Saul doesn't have any power. He's been chasing me. The Philistines, they don't have any power. Power belongs to God. That means, listen, nothing happens to you unless he allows it. Remember the story of Job? Here's Job. He's just living his life. He's doing the thing, man. There is no one like him. He loves God. He loves his wife. He loves his kids. I mean, he, he is the spitting image of his community of what a godly man is supposed to be. All the young guys are like, when I grow up, I won't be like Job. Satan came before God. And God started all this. I know some of you don't like to read Job, but do you know that God started it? People think, well, the devil didn't know. God started the conversation. He says, where have you been, Satan? Roaming to and fro through all the earth. Aren't you glad he's not everywhere at the same time like God is? He's on the move. He's, he's either to or he's fro. He's not, he's not both, but God is. He's, have you considered my servant Job? You can leave my name out of it, Lord, right? I, you don't have to brag about me. Don't need to, no need to boast about your humble servant, right? I don't want to be in any conversation. Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him. He fears God and he eschews evil. Satan's response. Oh, yes, I have. But you have a hedge about him. Job became the man that he was because God allowed it. No one can harm me unless God allows it. And if God allows it, listen, some of you in this room, you've had some bad things happen in your past. You've experienced heartbreak. You've been stabbed in the back. You've been betrayed. You have had some bad things happen to you. And you wonder, and some people come to the place where like, well, if God is good and he's, then why did he let this happen to me? I don't know the answer to that, but I know this. It's for your good. And I know sometimes it's like, how in the world could this be good? Apparently you don't know my God. He specializes in making things good. And he will start at the very worst place to do it. Remember Philip? He goes to Nathaniel. He says, we found Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel says, Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? That's the way my Jesus, your Jesus is, right? He starts in the very worst place to do his best work. I can't touch him. You've got a hedge about him. God says, okay, have at it. Spare his life. And then he comes back for round two. Where you been? Going to and fro? Have you considered my servant Job? Enough, Lord. But see, we, we read the book of Job wrong because we read all the things that happen in his life. 
But you got to keep reading to the end, and you think, oh, yeah, that's right, because he gets, he gets his kids back. He, that, no, you missed it. If that's what you read, you missed it. Because Job says, I have heard of you with mine ears, but now I have seen you with my eyes. Job says, because you let this happen to me, I know you now in a way that I would have never known before. Power belongs to him. <sighs> Verse 12. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy. So all of might and all of mercy comes from the Lord. And that's all I need. I need his might. I need his mercy. He has it all. He says, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Wow. That's good stuff. God alone is my salvation. God alone is my expectation. And God alone is my realization. If we will live our lives in those three truths, we won't spend a lot of time sounding like that. Little Liam, he's cute as a button, but he hadn't learned yet, right? He, he's either hungry or tired or whatever he is right now. And all he knows is, yeah, yeah, because he wants, he wants somebody to come to his aid. But as we grow in our relationship with the Lord, we realize, like David in this psalm, you know, I don't always have to ask God for stuff because he's got this. He's got me. Let's pray.